Uh, we had a couple more things to do before class today, so appreciate your patience. Hopefully you've been able to use the time with your groups, okay. Okay, so um, who can remember, what did we cover in class last time? What was the general topic we were talking about? Code contracts. It was code contracts, um, code specifications, right? Um, the specifications form part of a contract, an agreement between which two parties? So you have a contract, it's an agreement between two parties. Which are the two parties here? So there's a contract. Who's one party for the contract? Who's making the promises? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the developers, and there's developers on both sides, but if I develop some code and put in place a contract for my code by giving some specification, and I'm ensuring that my code will adhere to certain, to certain properties as long as you provide me with the requisite precondition. Yeah, I, I back there. Sorry? Oh, uh, Larissa has her hand up. Awesome. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, there's Lucas. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't tell with his hat on. Yeah, I also, uh, yeah, I have my hat up. Sorry, I hashed you to the same bucket. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, thanks. I'm, uh, my sight is not so good. So, uh, Larissa, yes. She texted, the other person um, yeah, the other person will be using the code. Exactly. It's the person who provides the code and the person who's using it. It's exactly it. Um, so each provides part of the bargain, right? Uh, the person who's providing the code ensures that as long as the user provides them with certain preconditions, they will deliver. It's kind of like a contract, you know, for construction, right? You know, I say, uh, I will deliver on this work if you pay me such and such amount of money, something like that. And each, if each side delivers, we're in good shape. So we talked about these code contracts and we talked about the motivation for them. Anyone want to remind us of a few motivations? What, what do these contracts allow us to do? It seems like a lot of work, but what does it allow us, what benefits does it confer? Yes. So, Jeremy. Uh, pre assertions is exactly right. You, you know, already you're kind of given for free um, things you can check within the code, within the code that that implements that that um, that contract, right? So we have the contract and then we have an implementation of it that adheres to it and we should be able to check that as long as the preconditions are met, the post conditions need to be met and we can check that the preconditions are met because if it's being used without those preconditions being met, you know, the other side is not living up to their bargain, the user. Lucas, did you have your hand up? Yes, yeah, so what I said, testing, but we need to understand every line of the code. Knowing what will be needed to have the code work and what will occur. She's on a roll. That's right. Um, so for testing, they don't have to understand all the details of the code. They just need to know what it guarantees, right? And things that it, that are not stated in the contract, people shouldn't be counting on. Right? They, people shouldn't be counting on things that are not in that contract. So even if testers do look over each line of the code, should they really be building all the features of those lines of the code, all the assumptions that that's exactly what this code does into their tests? Probably not, because the tests will be brittle, right? If the developers go and change, whether it's a, it's a bubble sort or quick sort, or they change it from quick sort to merge sort or whatever, suddenly the test breaks. You don't want, you don't want that. You want to have a contract that says, hey, look, this code, this code adheres to these guarantees and the testing can test those guarantees, right? 
and then knowing what will be needed to have the code work and what will occur. That's exactly right. Um, so what does the code need to do its job? And then if you provide it that, what does it achieve? What does that code do, right? So this, this is all part of the, con or part of the contract. And why is this a benefit? Well, it's a benefit, as Larissa said, to cut down the amount of detail we need to take in. We're a developer. We have enough work to do on our own. We don't want to have to go muck around with every bit of code out there in the system. Those are someone else's responsibilities. All we need to do to know is what their code does, what it adheres to. Just like you don't want to know when you ship a package via FedEx, you don't want to know all the details of the flight schedule they're using and the IT system they're using and color of the truck that's going to deliver it on the other side and where it's going to refuel and who's the driver and what's their birthday. I mean, you don't care about all those details. All you care about is that if you drop it off by noon, it'll get there by 5 p.m. the next day. Boom, done. So you care about contracts, in other words. And in the real world, we use these contracts to simplify our life. I know contracts seem to add complexity, but they allow us to avoid all sorts, worrying about all sorts of details. And so it is with code. Basically, it allows divide and conquer for the developers to divide up the work into pieces without each having to become an expert on everyone else's piece. Right? And it allows testing to occur in that context, it allows peer review to occur with greater efficiency. It allows the, the folks who are involved in sort of the design side to spec out what each thing should do without, without getting a complete specification of all the, the implementation and leave the implementation to someone else. It allows mocking to go on. And there's all these different benefits. And the last time we were together on Tuesday, I kind of enumerated some of these benefits. And I'm not gonna you know, comment on it except to say, there, you know, there's there's a lot of them, and we're going to come back to this one, this last one later. Because uh, as I said last time, what we're concentrating on here is specifications at the function level. It turns out there's another whole world when you're I didn't say the whole world, but there's a bigger set of issues when you're dealing with classes, whole classes. Just as a function adheres or a method adheres to certain specification. So does a class, but a class's specification has to consider additional things, things like history properties of this class and, and the invariance that it maintains. We'll come back to that. And there's a lot of, a lot of indirect benefits here, right? Um, greater conceptual clarity. If you have persons building you know, component A and component B, they can integrate them easily, more easily. A can use Bs. Um, there's easier understanding of the code if you do read it because you have a specification of what it's accomplishing up top. You don't have to figure that out from the code. Um, and sometimes you can have more aggressive optimization and, and easier uh, quality assurance. And, and the end principle here is low. Like so many investments in quality assurance, peer review, testing itself, uh, and you know, formal inspections as, as a specific type of peer review, they take time. But like any investment, you know, you hope what you put in will more than pay itself back, right? With investment, you got to put money in, right? If you're gonna, if you're gonna buy a home, uh, you have to put money down, and hopefully the value of that home will rise over time. If you're gonna invest in a stock, you know, you got to purchase the stock, and then you hope it'll rise in value, right? Um, same thing is true with any type of investing, put money in the bank to accrue interest. So this is a type of investment and normally they pay off in terms of really significant time savings. They spread knowledge around the group. So rather than everyone in the group having to talk with the developer of that component, every time they're gonna do something, they can just use the contracts. So it's, it's great stuff and it lowers risk of error and enhances speed of development and debugging and testing, et cetera. For debugging, it's great because you know, what is, what is this thing supposed to go into? So what do I want from you in this area? Well, what I'm looking for is a very particular thing. Uh, I'd like to see contracts in your code, okay? And this gives 
the high level statement of, of the purpose of the class or not. And I'm particularly looking for preconditions, post conditions for each method or function. Now, when I say for each, that's what I'd love to see. I'm, I'm not going to be, you know, digging you and say, you know, uh, I'm not going to count the functions that don't have these things, but at least a lot of the key functions, you should have these things, the ones that are hard to understand. I mean, if you have a getter and setter, you know, I'm not going to enforce uh, all of that. But if there's any really substantive code, code that you have to puzzle over, or, you know, that is documenting something a little bit tricky or some ordering that's not obvious, I want to see these. Okay. And I want to also see uh, for classes, we'll see a variance of history properties. And we're going to talk about those in a separate session coming up, but, but not today. Okay. So this is what I want to see for your preconditions, postconditions at the method or function level. We're going to go see some examples of that right now. And then we're going to see some examples coming from you. Mm. Um, so there's multiple ways of specifying, of, of giving these specifications, contributing to, to basically an understanding of what's guaranteed by this code software contract. This, this contract that provides guarantees. If you give me this, if you give me what I need to do my job, this is what job I'll, I'll do. Okay, one is preconditions, postconditions, uh, and invariance. Uh, another is preconditions, effects, and invariance. I'm going to focus on preconditions, postconditions, again, which are what you want to think about at a function level. So we're going to look at some classes, but I'm going to be focusing at a method level now. We're going to come back and look at these from the point of view of class level guarantees later. Some of these same examples. Okay. Okay. So we have some class. Uh, later will be relevant if it's a super class. You don't have to worry about that right now. So it's called re only in set. It's an integer set. It's a set of integers. That's read only. It, it's immutable. It doesn't get modified. So once you create it, it doesn't change. Okay. Um, this is the constructor. You give it some elements and it will construct this set. And uh, it has a method saying, does it, where you can ask it, does it include an element? A given int. This is an int set. And so this allows you to ask, hey, does this set include this int? Right. Mm. Hopefully that makes sense. And then there's an iterator through the elements. And you can quibble about whether this is the best way to do it, but that's really not the, the point here. The point is you have preconditions and post conditions that can be specified for each of them. And I give some examples of how you can specify these things. I'm giving these examples for two reasons. Number one, for your projects, I want to see something kind of like this for any. You know, really significant piece of code, like anything that has an algorithm or just something non obvious, et cetera. Something where people might want to understand what, what does this do? Right. Um, so uh, I'm giving this form, you say precondition colon, and this is what it's counting on to do its job. And as long as this is provided, you no, know, my conditional. As long as the precondition is met, the post condition has to be met. It guarantees this post condition. It will accomplish this, you know, and uh, in many cases, it's a return value. In other cases, it might be that it updates, you know, the UI or it sends an email message or it logs something to the database, right? I'll be side effects, but these are the post conditions. Okay, so this is a general form I'm looking for. Preconditions, postconditions. You folks must have seen this in some other class, right? What, which class? Uh, 370? 270? 270? Okay. Okay, trip down memory lane. Um, now, I want to draw a, your attention to a couple of things for the sake of the project where I'm looking for this, but also for the sake of a little exercise that's coming up in a few minutes before the end of class. Okay. Okay. Um, so here, for example, we might say, hey, look, the elements passed 
to this, the array of elements, these integers that are going to be in this set, um, it needs to not be null. Okay. Um, and so that's saying, hey, you can't pass me a null thing. Okay. One thing I didn't include it here, be worth worth saying, but it would make it, you know, it would require a little bit more words, would be maybe we want these elements to be distinct, right? We don't want to repeat in each of them. Um, but maybe we don't want to impose that. We want to, we'll figure out which are repeats and only have one of each, right? Um, uh, has, you know, has um, no precondition. You could pass it any integer and it will return true if it's an element of it, okay? Um, and uh, this iterator will return an iterator over the elements of the set. So this is a, a particularly simple example. But it shows the the syntax, the kind of the phrasing of what I'm looking for in preconditions, postcondition, right? So comment, read to me. Easy peasy. Any questions about this phrasing from online or from the class here? Questions? Is this is you're comfortable with this? Is a bit of Java code? Okay, let's go to another example. Okay, here's integer set. This is actually a, a slightly different uh, different one, but it has a has to ask, hey, is this thing in this set, right? This integer in this set. This one's not read only. This one is actually mutable. What do we mean by mutable? It can change. It can be changed. Yeah, it can evolve over time. That has all sorts of implications, which we may talk about in a later lecture. Uh, it turns out it's particularly easy to reason about things that don't change. Amongst other things, you don't have to worry there something's been changed in it. And I've got to check these conditions again. You can have multiple things share references without worry that one will stomp on it. Um, turns out there's there's some other benefits in terms of not having to copy it. To keep it sort of avoid avoid it being modified out from under you, um, and for security reasons, uh, immutable things are easier to deal with. But here we have an insert, and so we can insert an X. And the precondition here is that it does not already have an X, and the post condition is it has the X. So what does this precondition mean? Anyone should have a ball. What does that precondition mean? Yeah, Lee. The item you're trying to um, insert is not all, all the yes. That's right. It's not already inside the signature set. And afterwards, it is, right? Um, okay. And, and you'll notice it does say. Please note that insert cannot be used to insert duplicate elements. Now you could say, hey, well, that's that's obvious. It's enforced by this condition, right? If you if you try to call it twice in a row with insert one right after the other, where nothing else is modified, it you'll violate the precondition because the second time around it will be it will be in it, right? But that's the point. Like sometimes it's useful to provide a bit more information just to help people reason about it. You don't have to have it be unique specification or the minimal specification. It sometimes doesn't hurt to emphasize things that might not be immediate obvious. If someone's looking at this bleary eyed in the early wee hours of the morning as a developer and they glance at it, maybe this extra comment here will ring a bell so they don't have to reason it through, right? We don't want to count on everyone being, you know, perfect in their reasoning. So sometimes we put some other information. Now, the other thing I really want to emphasize about this, though, you notice this syntax. What's this has? Where where's this has coming from? That's up here in the precondition. Anyone? This this has right there. What's what's this has? Where do you see that has? Yeah, it's the thing right above it. So the point is when you, and this is important, and it will simplify your life. If you have several methods that you're, or, or functions that you're specifying, one can make use of the other in the specification. 
It's basically saying, you know, they have to play together nicely, right? They, they kind of work in concert to accomplish something. And has could be used in the specification to just avoid typing lots of extra stuff because has already has this sort of specification here and we can build on it by making use of it. And that's very common within these. You say, look, this one makes use of that one, et cetera. Um, either this is true or that's true or, or what have you. Um, so I want to emphasize that. Okay, that was the main thing I want to show in this particular example. Are you okay with that? Okay, let's let's uh, go on to another. Okay, so here's a counter. This is um, this is one where there's actually another side effect. There's a modification going on to it. So we create the counter, and then we can get it. it, it initially, when we create it as value zero. And we can get its value at any one time and we can increment it. Um, so this is an example of a, of a counter. Um, what? So you notice this is specifying with modifies in effect. So this actually says modifies so this. And then it, the effect of it is to increment. Instead of saying the post condition, we just, you know, the post condition is the the state of the counter is one greater than the precondition. Um, you could have said that, or you just say increments it. Okay. Now, how could this be improved? I, I actually put this up here to point out two things. One is to have this modifies effect as an alternative. I'll show that to you. Perfectly good way of saying this, and if you prefer to do that, I'm okay. But there's something that could be a little bit less ambiguous about that. Anyone? Yes. Yeah, so right now, like the effect can show up like what's the post condition, but right now the precondition is not that clear. So if we add like what kind of input do they have to provide, like what was the precondition, that okay. will be more helpful. Okay. Um, so in general, that will be true. Here, the uh, one precondition we know is true by reasoning is that this value, if these are the only three functions associated with this, or only three methods associated with, with this bunch of functionality, what has to be the case is the precondition. That the value of the counter is greater than or equal to zero. Because there's nothing decrement, right? There's nothing like reduce it, decor, or something like that. Um, all we can do is Create it, which has value zero. We can get it, which doesn't change the value. We can increment it. So its value is always at least zero or more. And so you kind of said, yeah, you know, there's a precondition here. Um, here the preconditions are not that onerous because anything that's created could automatically be incremented. But it wouldn't hurt to remind people that the value passed is always greater than or equal to zero, you know. So again, they don't have to reason it through looking at this and say, hmm, there can't be anything less than zero uh, here. Um, so that's that's a good point, uh, Shanti. You know, illuminating the, the precondition is, is often valuable and helping people reason through. Any anything else? Uh, yes, Jeremy. Uh, exactly. Because increment is one of those English words. You know, it's it's used by us computer scientists sometimes in a very particular way on um, to say oh increments, but even then we tend to say it increments by one, right? And you could say this is incremented by ten. That's a perfectly good use of the term, and this doesn't really say, right? And it, and it really should. It should probably say increases it by one at the least, something like that. That would be clearer. Leave less room for misunderstanding. Okay, now we're back to my read only dictionary. That's a read only, so we're back to that, but it's a dictionary. So, what does the dictionary do? Well, it maps from keys to elements of the dictionary, right? So, for a given key, we can look up an element. Maybe the keys are a student ID number, and we can look up the person's name or something like that. 
maybe the keys are, you know, the, um, the abbreviations of each province. Saskatchewan, Manitoba, SK, MD, ON, for Ontario, and, and we can look up the full province name, right? Uh, or maybe it's a city and the city population, something like that, right? Um, dictionaries are really, really useful. And so this is a read only dictionary. So it has to spring into life. Mark my words, like Apollo, no, it's like P Apollo. Uh, came into the world full born from, from Zeus I think, um, and Greek mythology. So here we have to create it up front, complete, right? So we give it a set of keys and a bunch of elements. But there's some subtleties here, right? Because these keys, what could go wrong? We give it a set of keys and, and, and some elements. What could go wrong? What, what should we think about? being clear about here. If we're implementing this, what thing would we want to be guarantee is the case to keep our life sane? What might you, you insist on for your precondition? Anyone? Yes. Uh, the keys are you, exactly your name again? Uh, at the end. So the key, these keys have to be unique would be a, a good precondition. Because if they're not unique, what bad, what weird thing could happen? You can be specifying different values for them. And then all hell breaks us, right? <laughs> okay, what am I supposed to assume for the population of Ottawa if I have two different numbers, right? Um, not very good. Okay, what else could go wrong here? You can actually see it in my specifications, but what else could go wrong? What else, well, what else could be whacked out about what you're given that would, Prevent you from doing your job meaningfully. Yes, Lee. You want to make sure there's one key for each value. Exactly, one key for each value, and it, one and exactly one, right? Um, so, if, if you had three keys and two values, you know, three city names and two populations, like. What gives? You know, like how am I how am I supposed to create a mapping between them, right? Um, so so that's important. What else could go wrong? Let's suppose the keys were guaranteed to be strings here. What else could go wrong? Those strings could be null, right? Or they they, they it could be a, a null value, right? And and the keys, if these were strings, you gotta look up. Presumably they are not the empty string. So here we're, we're insisting some things for our life as the developer of my read only dictionary. I'm insisting some things on some things that keep my life sane, that let me do my job with, with greater clarity, right? So I'm saying, hey, look, the size of the keys um, has to equal the size of the elements. So same, need to be the same number of things in there. And look, um, the keys have to be distinct. Now you could write that out. And that's perfectly good. I'm not gonna, not gonna freak out if you, you know, just write it out. Fine. I, I, as long as it's clearly defined. You know, some people like to to be a bit more formal about it, um, and and saying like, okay, look, two keys are the same only if they're the same key. Um, so this is how you read write it in mathematics, actually. Um, <laughs> The, the two keys are equal only if there's no duplicates in other words. Actually, uh, I think we said that, but there's no duplicates among them. Yes. So so there can only be one with that with that key. Okay. Um, and then for all keys, the key for all indices, which need to be the same number as the elements too, uh, the keys are not null, right? And the keys, the string is not null, and the string is not. An empty string. Great. That's what that specifies. Then the post condition is it says it's set to represent a map from keys to elements. Okay, great. I should have left a bit of space here. Um, okay, now get element. Now we pass in a key. What could go wrong? What what thing might you want to insist on to allow you to do your job as developer of get element, where you're given a key and you want to return what the the double value is associated with it, say the population. 
maybe it's Potlodge, kind of like city name Potlodge. What, what might you want to guarantee about this key? Yeah. Uh, that it exists. Exactly. Yeah, that it exists, exactly. And not only is it not null, it's not the empty string, right? Those are two different things. You can have a null, null reference. It doesn't point to any particular string. You can have another one that points to a very particular string that's empty. It's like it has no characters in it. Those are in Java, those are two very different things. And in most languages, they're, they're two very different things. Your name? Yeah. Zach, thank you. Zach, you, you switch around. I, 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 I hash people to their I have a key, I have a key to value map, which depends on people's location and whether they're wearing a hat, um, which is not very good. Yes. Um, how, how come you couldn't have um, the empty string? Like couldn't it just be like well, good, good question. Um, like, should we ban the empty string? Okay, you could say, and and the question there extends to nulls, right? Like, should I allow a null and just say I don't have a double corresponding to it? Return a notice it's capital D double, so you can actually return a a null double. Like, if you want that to be part of your contract, you could. It just may hide errors. Now, as far as passing an empty string, yeah, I mean, it, it depends what you want to allow. Um, if you want to allow that, it, you know, the thing is, this insisted, the, the creation here, insisted that the keys not be empty. So do you want to allow a key that could not possibly be in here, right? Um, maybe, maybe. Um, that's the only key which, given the specification, could not. It's a string that is guaranteed to not be in this dictionary, right? Like, in other words, from how the dictionary is created, you know, the the, the keys could be any text, right? It could be the text of War and Peace. It could be a, you know, a disquisition and and uh, that mixes together seven different scripts from different languages around the world. It could be any number of things. But we know it can't be uh, an empty string. So do you, you know, do you want to be picky about saying, well, I know this won't include an empty string, so you can't ask me if there's an empty string in it. Um, maybe not. Maybe you do. I, I, you know, it depends on what you want to guarantee. Some of these preconditions make your life easier, right? They I mean you don't have to worry about, you know, dealing with with some throwing an exception or dealing with some complex or characteristic, but ultimately it is a choice, right? It's a choice about what functionality you want to define. If you insist that it's not empty, maybe you're gonna have a lot of people who would call it. They don't want to have to worry if the string is empty or not. They just want to know, is it in here? And now they won't be able to use it without putting the check on their side. So do you want to do the work or do you want your your users to do the work as part of it? And sometimes if it takes you a lot of, you have to do a lot of work and it's by contrast, it's little work on their part, maybe you want to insist on it, you know, if it would require a lot more complicated algorithm or what have you. Um, okay, um, so, you know, that was an example of, of get element. And then basically it says, look, um, you know, it, it contains a mapping from that key that was specified to some D might be a precondition. This is interesting because get element here, actually, so this is related to your question, Lee. Um, here we're actually saying as precondition, this has to be a legitimate key, in which case it can't be empty. It's very clear, right? That, that's a special case. It can't be empty um, because of the rules here. We know that, and otherwise we, we just say this mapping from it to some, um, and then we return it. But this is basically saying, "Hey, don't, don't call me with something that's not in here." Maybe we want to allow that by returning a null double. You know, um, we also have is occupied key, and you know, here what we should have said is probably for the precondition, is occupied key for that key is true. 
Um, and we could have had that be part of this guarantee. And that will be using this, right? So I'll, I'll actually put it in here. Um, I'll, I'll interrupt this and I will say, instead of saying this, I will say is, okay, um, using a different font, is occupied key, key if, if that. In other words, I'm calling off to, I'm just delegating it to is occupied key. And to make this less textually overwhelming, I'm gonna use white space. White space matters, and um, uh, you know this. Um, uh, oh, okay, so I'm confused. Right. Okay, and we want to have no, 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 no. Okay, um, abstraction. Okay, yeah, um, and yeah, that's what we want. Right. Okay. So this was a bit more subtle an example. But you see again that I'm using one of these these conditions, right? Um, okay. Um, good. Any questions? Here. This could have been called has. We call is occupied. Okay. Um, okay. Here's here's another example of a specification. I'm watching the the time here. Um, Index string. So here, this is basically saying what is the index of the first one within the second one, right? And it's finding it. Um, it it says, okay, look, if either is null, it throws an exception. Otherwise, if this if the first the thing to look for for what you're looking occurs uh, if it's empty, sorry, throw empty exception, different exception. And otherwise, uh, if it is indeed one, return the least index, right? Um, and the point I want to bring out here is that it's actually uh, specifying some examples here. It's another good thing to have in your specifications, include some examples. And these examples kind of show operationally how it works. Another thing is to weave in some test cases, right? And, and you can look at it, but often the users of the library won't see it. This gives people who use the library the chance to see some examples of how it's used. This is a really good practice for specification. And if you show it within your projects, I will be a very happy camper. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so here's just a couple of examples on. On subset, a lot of these are from this book by uh, Lisko, the Blue Tiger Mesh, really be a, um, uh, a, a, a sort of credit and an accreditation to them or uh, uh, attribution to them. Okay, subset. So this is asking is one inset a subset of another. And this says, look, if either is null, it throws an exception, otherwise returns true if S1 is a subset of S2, otherwise returns false. Why is this ambiguous? There's a certain word here that's ambiguous. It's a word, a six character. You know, subset. Subset is ambiguous because how do we, what's two different uses of the word subset? So if we have a set, give me one. So so this is a point line is a b c d e f right. Um, okay. Um, so give me a subset of this. Pick a subset. Um, Okay, the empty subset. Yeah, yeah, the empty subset. I love it. I love it. Um, so the empty subset is a subset of this. Okay. Um, or we might write it like this with curly brackets, right? Uh, so is it a subset? Yeah, it's a subset. Uh -huh. That's legitimate. What's another subset? What's the opposite extreme? Everything. Everything. Yeah. And technically, it's a subset. But often, when people talk about the word subset, 
They actually mean something smaller than that. It's like a, it's a subset. You know, it's a, it's it's a less complete set, right? But technically, the word in its most common sense is used. Well, in its mathematical sense, it's used to allow for the entire. Um, and it's a bit of an ambiguity. And so it's it's better to be quite clear. And so you know, something that would be much more detailed is to say returns true if every element of S1 is an element of S2. Okay. Um, otherwise, it returns false. Um, and that would be true for the full set. Um, you know, a good mix here is, you know, in terms of succinctness, but by clarity, you could say um, uh, returns true if S1 is a subset of S2, otherwise returns false, i.e., returns true if every element of S1 is an element of S2. So this basically just says, uses the colloquial term. It says if S1 is a subset of S2, that's this first one. But, but then it provides extra explanation if you want to go a bit deeper, if you want to clarify exactly what is meant. So you don't have to see it, but you can. Okay. Um, and, you know, sometimes this reveals inconsistencies. If you provide more, you realize, oh, uh, okay, um, you know, uh, this actually had a problem. So what's the problem with, with uh, this? Uh, well, okay, so, so this is a specification. It is a legitimate specification. Too cold, okay. Uh, I think we, we, we qualify for the too cold sometimes here. Um, returns true if temperature is less than or equal to zero degrees Fahrenheit, otherwise returns false. Um, but that specification doesn't communicate perhaps what the intention was here, which is to say returns true when temp is not greater than the freezing point of water at standard temperature, which is not zero degrees Fahrenheit. Anyone know what it is? 32. 32, 32 degrees. That's zero Celsius, 32 Fahrenheit. That's freezing point. Okay. And, you know, something a little bit more fulsome for a specification brings that up, right? Okay. Um, and also, this is it's ambiguous. I mean, you wouldn't think it. A billion commonly here means 10 to the ninth, but. Um, but if you just say, like, return the integer 1 billion in the specification, it turns out this means different things in North America. And, you know, you, you, by writing it out, you say, i.e. this, you just give less room for misunderstanding. Okay, so here's the exercise. Okay. Um, and those of you who uh, are attending remotely, or in person or in luck, because today we have our first pop quiz. Okay. Um, so um, I'm going to yeah. pass it out here, but uh, for those attending remotely, um, you uh, can go to the Canvas site. Uh, those, those who are here, you know, in, in person could also go if you prefer to Canvas and fill it out. If you don't have a pen or something, you could fill it out online. If you go to Canvas, maybe someone could tell me uh, just to confirm. Um, it's actually the first pop quiz that I've delivered with, with Canvas. Or I should say more technically, it's the first pop quiz I've attempted to deliver with Canvas. But Larissa uh, has indicated it seems to be available offline, pop quiz one. So I'm going to pass these out in person, OK? Uh, but it's the same thing. Okay. Um, and what I want you to do is for each of, I'll put the slide up so you can, you can see it here. Um, uh, basically for each of these, I want you to attempt to create a specification. Okay. And um, just, I'm not going to harsh you on actually the quality of your specification. Um, but I want you to think about it, and then we'll get into discussing. Okay. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get out of lower bars. If you 
the view or give some things that forgets about certain things. I'm just, I just want you to struggle with it. And then we'll talk about what a good solution might be. Two plus quiz and you'll get full marks. If you're here to hear this online or in person, uh, okay, so you'll do it online, right? And you do it online? Do you want to do it online? Oh, yes. Okay. Okay, sir. Sure. Are we allowed to access our notes at all? Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to dig you with this plus good or more good. So if you want to do that, pick one. Come on, let's think through how to, how to do this.
for the pop quiz uh, here and elsewhere is to get you to substantively think about applying these principles we've just talked about. Uh, these principles of being clear enough, not being overly wordy, maybe providing a bit of extra information, um, using other methods that you've defined and, and a definition of some of the, the, the specifications, etc. So let's go back and look at one possible set of examples of, of solutions. So I'm not going to claim that these are, you know, the definitive ones or the best, but, um, you know, for find first, um, really it's like auto, capital, the auto capitalization. Okay, I, you know, I said, look, find the location. This, arguably, this really should have been the index of the string. I, I probably should have said index. Um, location has a kind of nice intuitive feel to it, but we're talking about the the index of string being found within this. And what I said for the preconditions here is look, these two things should be non null. Um, I don't want to have to deal with nulls, like someone passing me nulls, which I don't know what it means. And I said, look, at least the string being found should have a, le a length greater than zero. You notice I, I used a kind of property there. Now, the thing that you're trying to find it in, that could be empty reasonably. You know, you're trying to find it in something that happens to be empty. But at least it's not really well defined if you say find an empty string in something other than an empty in an empty value, right? Like, how do you, even if I have the value AA, like, and I look for an empty string, at it, how many occurrences does it have? You know, it's not really well defined. Post conditioner, I said return the minimum index I of stir find it such that. And I use this extract substring, um, uh, you know, is equal to that. Um, I probably should have said, you know, where this uh, appears at uh, minus one if there's no such index. I said the first such index is zero, meaning it's considered zero. It's going from zero, not one. Okay. Um, so, you know, you could. Flesh this out. I give some critiques of it right there. It's a quick to have a book too, but but it's you know a start, right? Um, and it, and it helps clarify some things. Personally, I think it can be made a bit more intuitive at this level by saying, i.e., the the minimum index at which it occurs. You know. Um, okay. Count substring occurrence. Here we have a stir find that as for being found. It's confusing. These are in the reverse order. They should have been same order to be less confusing and people don't forget that that was a bad, bad thing. Returns the count of occurrences of the string being found in this. In the preconditions, I said, once again, they have to be non-null and the thing being found again should be greater than zero. And it returns the count of distinct indices i. You could argue about whether distinct has to be in there. Um, maybe it could just be the count of indices i, but distinct makes it clear. We're counting the number of distinct um occurrences such that you know the the string being found is located at that position to extract substring zero if there's no such index so, um, you know allowing that possibility i'm not going to throw an exception if there if it doesn't occur or something like that so i, I want to indicate yeah you're you can do this with one it's not actually in the pot. You, you don't have to worry it'll blow up right and something like that um, now you might think, well, it shouldn't blow up based on one of the other information here. Yeah, but it's kind of nice to provide that guarantee very clearly. Um, extract substring, and, and this says, you know, look, okay, pass it a, a string and a, and a start and final. And I said, start and final are indices into string, into the string where index zero indicates the first character of this. Um, and I say it extracts the substring of spur starting at and including. This is one of the terrible things about English, by the way. You don't say including, I'll say, you know, um, I'll be there by, you know, October 17th. It's not clear if you mean you'll be there before. It, or if you say I'll be there before then, it's not totally clear if you're including the 17th itself. And so often you say including to indicate, yes, you're allowed to do that. So starting at and including index start up to and including index final. 
uh, where fine L is greater than or equal to start. And both start and final need to lie within the bounds of the string. I just said it kind of intuitively there. And the precondition here is that the string is not null. Yeah. Um, don't give me a bum string that's, it doesn't even, it's not a string. And, you know, zero is less than or equal to start. So start can't be less than or equal, can't be less than zero. And start has to be less than or equal to final. You know, it, it can't be, can't be that start is greater than final, right? Um, it could be equal to final, that's okay. And start, start could be equal to zero, that's okay. But you should never have start greater than final, and you should never have start less than zero, right? Um, and then final should be less than the string one. Notice it's less than because it does start at zero, index zero is the minimum. So, uh, and the post condition returns the substring of it, starting at it, including the index start of the include. You know, you could, you might be able to improve that. So, but this is an example of some preconditions and post conditions for those. Yeah. Uh, for the second condition where you say zero is less than equal to yeah. zero, yeah, that one. Yeah. Uh, can't you have like start is negative one and final is negative one? That way, like it's abstracting backwards. Uh, okay, I didn't allow it here, um, but you're saying, wouldn't it be nice if it allowed like minus one and minus three to, to indicate indexing from the end of the string, right? And I have ruled that out here, but that would be an alternative legitimate interpretation that you could have in a code contract. This rules out that implementation. That rules out that functionality. If you wanted that functionality, you would have to change this. And this ordering constraint would be different, right? Because if it's negative, it's going, you know, in the opposite order, kind of, uh, in terms of start versus final, right? Minus three is, is well, minus three is earlier in the string than minus one. And, and you wouldn't have this zero constraint here. Um, so you could you could do that, um, and that would be a different contract. It would be a different implementation and a different contract, a different set of functionality. And maybe your library would be more popular because this one it does not allow that, right? Um, and requires programmers to think in their head about what start and final is, um, like by saying final equals the length minus one explicitly when they really want to just say it's the last darn character. <laughs> Straight, whatever it is. Yeah. So that's good. Any other comments, questions about this? Okay. So we're going to come back to this topic in two ways. One, for classes where we have this expanded set of issues we have to deal with, the variance of history properties, the list of substitution principle. And two, we're going to come back to it for testing. Okay. Where you're going to put in place tests. That will test code like this. And you're going to come up with clever test cases to see does it, in fact, adhere to this? You know, is in fact achieving these things? And these specifications be like gold for that. I mean, it's just test gives you all these things to test, just like at the very start of this lecture, Louisa pointed out online. Okay. Awesome. So that's all for today. Um, thank you very much. You finished your first quiz. Please give it to me if you didn't turn it in online. And uh, I will take into account. So basically, you're you're getting rewarded for coming to class and interacting with your peers. Great. Oh, you did all that. Okay. Did anyone put their name on this? Yeah. Okay, you put a, put your name on it. Okay, thanks folks. Take care. Stay safe.